A car that produces more downforce than it weighs could drive upside down on the ceiling of a tunnel. That's something we've all heard, but in reality, things are more complicated than that. If you search for Formula One upside down on Google, you'll find lots of articles, videos, and even academic papers, all making the simple claim that if your car makes more downforce than its weight, then it can drive upside down. That might sound reasonable, but it ignores one thing, traction. Actually, it ignores lots of other things like the car needing inverted fuel and oil systems, but those things are achievable and are used in aerobatic aeroplanes, so we can assume they could be made to work for a car. However, traction is the one thing that many of these videos and articles conspicuously fail to discuss. One of the most popular YouTube videos on this subject is by Driver61, and while he specifically mentions traction in the intro to the video, he never mentions it again. This paper by some physicists at the University of Leicester tackles the maths head on and comes to the conclusion that a Formula One car could drive upside down at any speed above 111 miles per hour. But again, this doesn't consider the need for traction. So why is traction important? For a car to be able to drive any distance upside down, it first has to get up to the speed where its downforce can hold it to the ceiling, but then it has to be able to keep going at that speed. The tyres have to have enough traction against the ceiling to be able to drive the car forward working against the aerodynamic drag force that's trying to slow it down. If you don't have enough traction, it doesn't matter how much power your engine has, your wheels will just spin, the car will slow down, the downforce disappears, and the car crashes to the ground. The traction available from a tyre is directly related to the load pushing the tyre against the road surface. Most tyres have a coefficient of friction of about 1, which means that for every 100 kilograms, or 1,000 newtons roughly, of force pressing the tyre to the road, the tyre will be able to push the car forward with the same force, a thousand newtons. If the load on the tyre doubles, then the tyre can push the car forward with twice as much force, but if it halves, the tyre can only push forward with half as much force. This is the whole reason F1 cars have downforce in the first place. A greater force pushing down on the tyres means that the tyres have more traction to accelerate and brake the car or to turn it through a corner. But if your F1 car was only going just fast enough to produce its own weight in downforce when you turned it upside down, the force pressing the tyre up onto the ceiling of the tunnel would be zero. Nothing. This is a very simple two-dimensional F1 simulator I've set up online, and you can play with it yourself later. It lets us see the load on each tyre in blue, the force pushing the car forward in red. The green arrow shows how much traction is available based on the current load on the tyres. Right now the car is doing just under 100 miles per hour and is generating just over its own weight in downforce, 105% shown here. Now if I flip the car upside down and pause the simulation, you can see that the blue arrows have completely disappeared. There is no load left to press the tyres up against the ceiling of the tunnel. The green arrow has also disappeared because without any load on the tyres there can be no traction. The downforce was only just enough to balance the car's weight, so there's nothing left to press the car up against the ceiling. And as soon as I unpause the simulation, we'll see that the, without any traction, the car rapidly decelerates and falls to the ground. To successfully go upside down and stay there, you need to generate a lot more downforce than your weight, so that there's enough left over to press the tyres into the ceiling and generate some traction. Now, in the case of a Formula One car, this is pretty temporary setback. Our F1 car generates its own weight in downforce from a very low speed, only about 100 miles an hour. And F1 cars can go much faster than that. Downforce increases with the square of the speed, so if you go twice as fast, you get four times the downforce. Or to put it another way, to get double the downforce, you only have to go about 40% faster. So all I have to do is accelerate the car up to about 140 miles per hour. Just increase the torque setting here. We'll get up to about 140. And now we see the speed is 136 miles per hour and we've got 202% downforce, just over double the car's weight in downforce now at this speed. So now if I flip the car upside down, there's still some load left to generate some traction. We've got a much less load pushing the car up than when it was up the right way, but there's enough to give us enough traction, shown by this green arrow, to keep the car going forward at this speed. I can even reduce the speed slightly, playing with fire a little bit, 
wouldn't want to be the driver in here. You can see as it's just the car is slowing down, the green arrow comes back. The downforce is bleeding off. But it's still just about driving upside down successfully at 126 miles per hour. Wouldn't want to go much slower than that. But it can work. However, an F1 car can only do that due to its extreme aerodynamics. Big wings plus the ground effects and the diffuser. Very few other cars can generate their own weight in downforce from such a low speed as 100 miles per hour. So let's look at another example, the Radical SR8. In 2004, this press release announced that the Radical SR8 generates more downforce than its weight. It says at the SR8's maximum speed of 170 miles per hour, the sports prototype produced more downforce than the car's weight, complete with a full tank of fuel and driver. And it then went on to say, our next test will, get, will be to get our best driver, Michael Vergas, to drive the car upside down in a tunnel, exclamation mark. But based on the performance figures given here, the Radical SR8 would not be able to drive upside down on the roof of a tunnel, despite producing more downforce than its weight, because it would just not have enough traction. So here I've set up the simulator to replicate the SR8's performance, although the model shown is still an F1 car. This is mimicking the Radical SR8's performance. So we've got the coefficient of drag set such that at the car's top speed of about 175 miles per hour, it's using about 370 wheel horsepower. So this is calculated from the, the torque required at the back wheels to generate the appropriate amount of thrust to overcome the drag at that speed. So that's how much drag it must be producing in order to get to 175 miles per hour on about 373 wheel horsepower. And at that speed, I've set the lift coefficient or the downforce coefficient to 0 0.9, and that's producing just over the car's weight in downforce, about 10% more. So we've got 109% of the car's weight in downforce at this speed. Now the problem is, to maintain this speed, the car is producing, as shown by the red arrow here, three and a half thousand newtons of thrust to overcome the three and a half thousand newtons of drag. Now, as soon as I turn the car upside down and pause the simulation, you can see that the net force pushing the car up into the ceiling has already dropped to virtually zero. There's there's just nothing left. There's only enough traction for the car to generate about 33 newtons of thrust to push it forward. And that's nowhere near enough to overcome the 3,000 newtons of drag. So the car is immediately spinning its wheels, slowing down drastically due to the drag, it's still holding onto the ceiling at the moment because the downforce is just over its weight by 1%. But as soon as I unpause the simulation, the car comes crashing down just like that. Let's look at one more example, the Celine S7. This is actually the car that inspired this video. It was featured by Doug DeMuro last year, with Doug repeating the usual claim that because the car can generate its own weight in downforce, it would be able to drive on the ceiling. Doug even suggested setting up a crowdfunding campaign to build a looping track in the desert to test the theory out. Based on the published numbers, the S7 might be capable of, a, of the upside down trick, just like an F1 car, but the figures are very hard to verify. Various sources claim that the S7 produces its own weight in downforce at 160 miles per hour and goes on to a top speed of about 220 miles per hour from 550 horsepower but I couldn't find any independent verification of either figure. Let's assume the figures are correct. If I set up the simulator to make those figures work, then yes, the S7 would be able to drive upside down from about 190 miles per hour and upwards. But is this setup realistic? To get that top speed from that much power, you need a very low drag coefficient of about 0.34, and that means you can't be generating much downforce. Generating downforce creates lots of drag, that's why F1 cars have drag coefficients starting at around 0.8 to 0.9. By comparison, the McLaren F1, which could reach maybe 240 miles an hour from a 618 horsepower engine, is known to have a very low drag coefficient of 0.32 and produces very little downforce. In my simulator, I can set the lift and drag coefficients separately, but that's not possible in real life. High downforce means high drag, a trade-off that all Formula 1 fans are familiar with. 
I strongly suspect that the claims for the S7's downforce figure, or its top speed, are exaggerated. Or at least, if they did achieve those figures, it wasn't the same car at the same time. Rigging the car for 100% downforce at 160 miles per hour would result in far too much drag for it to be able to achieve 220 miles per hour from a 550 horsepower motor. So, can a Formula One car drive upside down on the ceiling of a tunnel? Yes, it can. But it's a much harder trick to put off than it seems at first sight, and very few other cars can do it. So thanks for watching. Please uh, leave a comment and uh, like and subscribe and all that stuff. If you'd like to play with this simulator yourself, you can. It's online at my website. The link's in the description, along with various other links to uh, other websites and documents I've talked about. And uh, if you'd like to actually look at the code for the simulator, it's all just plain JavaScript. Uh, you're welcome to it. It's on GitHub as well. So take a look there. Thanks for watching.